Um, I'm Meredith St. Cal. I'm the Vice President of Marketing at Palvin, um, or Commercial Furniture Business. If you haven't stopped by our booth yet, I strongly recommend you do. Um, and welcome to our panel on agile and flexible workplaces. Um, can everyone just take a minute and introduce themselves? Um, I'm Sarah Baldi, I'm the Vice President of Global Workplace for McKesson Corporation. Um, I've also held that role at Kaiser Permanente. Um, that's me. Yeah. Hi everyone, my name is Katie Rodriguez. I'm the Vice President of Workplace Strategy and our consulting practice at JLL, and I lead Workplace Strategy Services in the West Coast region. Um, I've been doing workplace strategy for over a decade, and my background is in human factors, ergonomics, so very much focused on how people are impacted by their work environment so that they can be happy and productive. Um, working with a lot of different clients um, who have a spectrum of agile and flexible workplaces, um, so thanks for having me. Um, my name is Andres Cueto. I am Portfolio Director at BBDA Compass. Um, we're part of a multinational bank. Um, and Agile is very important to us because we're on a transformation for the last several years to become more of a digital uh, enterprise, more of a software type a company than a traditional bank. And that's where Agile uh, comes into play. And I manage half of our portfolio um, in the US. I'm Amanda Marrow with Capital One. I'm a workplace strategist and designer, um, almost like an internal consultant um, within our workplace solutions group. Um, and we really work to create compelling solutions for our associates so that they can provide the best products and services um, for our customers. Thanks. Uh, I'm Phil Conley, uh, manager of design and construction at Liberty Mutual Insurance. Uh, my team uh, of eight people do the design and construction execution of about 100 projects a year, uh, specifically for Liberty Mutual, impacts about a million square feet. Uh, mostly new construction, renovations, contractions, expansions, things like that. Okay, great. Let's dive right in and start at the beginning. What, um, what is agile workspaces? What's activity-based workplaces? What, how have you seen those? Um, in, out there in the world. <laughs> uh, so we were talking about this just a little bit before we started. Uh, the, the nomenclature is really confusing and uh, everyone kind of uh, thinks of these words in different ways. So um, activity-based planning in the traditional sense is really focused on a variety of spaces that support multiple sets of activities. How individuals are assigned within that space can also vary, but we're seeing definitely that it's much more of a flexible, uh, unassigned sort of model so that people have the choice to work in a variety of different settings depending on what they're doing. Um, flexible can also mean a variety of things, um, from just having a variety of spaces to unassigned. Um, even seeing flexible workspaces mean co-working spaces and having flexibility within your portfolio to be able to adopt uh, to different types of needs, growth and reorgs and uh, changes in sizes of spaces. Um, and then on the agile workspace side, we're just mentioning too that agile traditionally has come from the process of agile working and it, that means different things to different teams. There's traditional agile processes where they're following the agile ma manifesto to the T, that's the big A, right? Um, versus the little A, which is just kind of toe in the water, uh, uh, trying out different agile methodologies. And so an agile workspace would actually support a very flexible agile work process. Um, but that's sort of been, uh, I don't know, adapted into the workplace world and just meant flexibility too. So different things to different people. Yeah, something to add up to that is even within an organization, uh, you see that difference. So we started the Agile transformation with our developers, uh, product developers, because that's the natural uh, type of people that Agile was designed for. Um, and it's successful and it's something that we want to do more. And as a company,
company, we want to be what is called a project-based organization. So we all work more as projects and not uh, defined by roles. So we decided to roll out Agile to the entire workforce. And we're going by different lines of business. And each line of business or support group that adopts Agile, they're doing it in a different way. Because what they do is different. Um, so I think you see the developers and the product developers and the engineering people are doing the capital A Agile. Uh, and they tend to be more complicated and they're able to do a lot of these things more naturally. But when you talk about human resources, um, talk about corporate real estate, different functions that just based on the nature of their work, some things all they do is they create a Kanban and they did post-its and they say we're agile. But their their workflow and, and the way they work hasn't really changed. Okay, okay. so at Liberty Mutual, um, they're two completely different things. So agile for us is basically contained to IT and it is groups that have gone through the capital A, you know, believe in different things that go with agile processes. Uh, flex space and activity-based working, what we call flex space, um, is actually unassigned uh, type work, whereas Agile is actually one of our only groups that is assigned. Uh, so they're, they're two very different things, uh, at least at Liberty. I think for us at McKesson, um, we have many different functions. Obviously, we're a pharmaceutical company, but we do have developers, and we do have back office processing, and we have claims, and all kinds of traditional uses of space. So the mandate for our workplace team is really to design envelopes of space that can be used for any one of those functions on the flip of a dime. And so what we've come up with is, um, in you know three years ago at McKesson, what you would have seen is a very traditional office space, six by eight cubes, um, one office to every so many cubes, probably pretty office dense. And where we've gone is entirely different. So we have um, our design guidelines, which are it's basically a room kit. And we build, I want to say, I'm going to misquote this, but I think we're down to like six room sizes that we will build in a campus. And each of those six room sizes, when we build it behind the walls with infrastructure and power and everything, are set up to be transformed by the FM team to be overnight with just a furniture swap from, for example, a 10 by 12 can be an office, a private office. It can be swapped to a dual office. It can be swapped to a huddle room. Um, so there are many different uses that then make our envelope of space pretty agile. Uh, separately, some of our groups are uh, taking the opportunity, you know, we're getting a lot of pressure to shrink the size of the portfolio. We're taking a hard look at what people are actually doing or what they need to be doing when they're in at work. Um, you know, the commute here in San Francisco is pretty bad. Do people really need to come in every day from 9 to 5? or? You know, are they coming in for a few hours a day to have a few meetings or, or collaborate? You know, what are they doing? So, uh, we've been using a lot of our sensor data and doing a lot of studies on what people are actually doing there. And it's, um, I just was in Scottsdale yesterday and final reviews of the new site we're building, which we're calling the Montessori School. Um, and it's because this particular group, it's our one of our IT organizations and our cybersecurity group, we're putting 600 employees out there. Um, but what they need to do is very project-based. And depending on what kind of project they're doing, whether they're doing pair programming or whether they're working um, on a blitz team, it's very different throughout the day. So um, this particular space that we're working on is entirely modular, modular, I can't say that, um, and very flexible. Um, also, a lot less traditional, a lot less desks, a lot more areas where you could move tables in if you wanted to and set up a war room. Um, Again, and to me, that's really activity-based design, and I think that's where we're going to be headed because, you know, in the same envelope of space, not only do you, are you able to fit a lot more people or have it as a resource for a lot more employees, but you're able to offer the employees a lot more choice of environment to work in. And just to play off of that, at Capital One, we feel like we work at the speed of technology, right? We're really a technology company. We've evolved from a traditional bank into something else, this technology company, right? So with that, I want to kind of roll into up on the slide, we see our 2018 work environment survey. These are the key elements um, that we found through the survey. We went out 
to 3,500 office professionals across the country, and we asked them their thoughts on workplace design and the impact of employee experience on satisfaction, creativity, and productivity at work. And what we found through that was that flexibility really does matter, and so does office design, right? And it's not just kitschy design, it's design that drives that productivity and innovation that we really need to deliver those products and tools for our customers and end users. Um, so you guys all work for larger companies that have probably started with um, the cubicle model. How do you make a change like this happen and keep happening over time? <laughs> would say it does not happen overnight. <laughs> um, but I, I would say that Capital One leverages uh, workplace design guidelines and we also have a kit of parts standards and that kind of helps build and then we get to have variability say within ancillary furniture and some other specialty spaces um, and there are always exceptions to the rule. Yeah. And I think I love that. That first step is the hardest one, right? When, once you start down that path and people see it, it's going to be easier. But that first step, you know, the previous two speakers mentioned the change management. So that is critical. You have to invite your users, you do prototypes, you do testing. Um, we did the first place we ever did in the open environment was with our HR team because they were going to be some instrumental in rolling it out. They were kind of the, the guinea pigs. Um, in our organization, before we did this, we realigned the corporate real estate from being part of the finance team and the CEO to actually be part of the HR, which we call talent and culture, because what we do with the spaces is going to drive the culture of the organization. Um, and you know, when you start talking about why you're doing this, a lot of it there's business needs. Uh, one of them is attracting and retaining, retaining the best talent. And, from all the surveys and research, you know that this is going to help you do that. So you put it as part of HR, uh, you create a strategy of uh, change management, and then you start rolling it out. And you know, it, it's not for everyone. Uh, there's people that won't like it, but that to me is where that flexibility and that activity-based design is critical. If you just say, I'm going to get rid of the queues and put benches, it's not going to work. You have to have that choice. So if you're going to do focus work, you have to have an area to do that. If you're going to collaborate, you have to have an area to do that. So depending on the activity you're doing, which will change from day to day, sometimes several times in a day. So there's the flexibility of reconfiguring and rebuilding, but also the flexibility of where am I going to work on a given day. Sometimes I'm going to work on my desk. Sometimes I'm going to work in the little phone booth like that one. Uh, sometimes I'm going to be in a conference room. And having that activity-based uh, design and that flexibility that's what you need, and, and the users have to understand that. Uh, like, like I said earlier, if you, you do all of this and the users don't know what you're giving them, and they, they're not utilizing it, then, then you need to know. I say don't boil the ocean. Uh, find a few bright spots and a few volunteers first if you're starting to roll out a program, um, or if it change. Make it successful, put the resources you need to make it successful. Um, the other big key is, and I've fallen victim to this before, don't, out, don't let your degree of change outpace your leadership support because from the top down, you need everybody uh, banging on the, the same drum. Um, and then the other real key is market your successes. So when you make a huge environment change, get as many leaders out there to sit in it and work in it and, um, and then be an advocate for the change out within the portfolio. So. I think like you, we had HR go first and real estate, HR and real estate went first and um, we called it a, a test pilot and we invited other people to come in and we took feedback and we really did use it as that uh, for about six to eight months and little did they know we were already building the next project, <laughs> but it made it much easier to move people in uh, to the new environment. I'll just add that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I was just going to say that in a lot of organizations where they've been the most successful is those early adopters, but uh, definitely finding the teams that are raising their hand and asking for it, you know, support them, do the change management, get the testimonials, all of that is really great fodder for continuous communications and uh, getting folks on board. Yeah, I was going to say, so I, I think most of what we've done in 
you know, to get from a cube farm to where we are today. We didn't do it to the business. They sort of asked for it over time. And I, I mean, going back as far as 14 years ago, it was high walls, one cube, two office sizes, and that was it for 50,000 people. So it didn't matter what you wanted, that's what you got. Um, maybe eight or nine years ago, our field legal group was one of the first ones that said, we want to take attorneys out of offices and give them shared workstations because they're never in the office, which, and they wanted little focus rooms for them and everything, which was activity-based working. They just didn't know it at the time. Uh, so it's evolved throughout the businesses and rather than us just say, this is what we're going to do now, start working this way. Yeah. Um, you mentioned culture as a big driver of changing the workplace this way. Wellness in the office has been probably the biggest topic in um, office culture over the last few years. How do you consider um, wellness when you're designing agile offices? Is it a consideration? How big of a consideration? And um, what does that end up looking like? <coughs> I'll go ahead and give an example. At Capital One, wellness for us is kind of, it's, it's holistic, right? We want to think about people bringing their whole selves to work. Our culture is inclusive, innovative, and flexible, and we want people to have spaces that they need when they need it because our workforce is empowered to work when, where, and how works best for them. Um, so that they can be innovative, right? And so for us, it means providing wellness spaces like having on-site fitness centers, as well as healthy food options. Um, mother suites are really important and well-designed mother suites. Um, we've seen some, some terrible interpretations. We're all laughing. Yes, we've seen really bad interpretations, possibly used some really bad interpretations. But um, on top of that, um, mindfulness spaces, um, spaces where people can get away and they can really decompress. Um, and it, it's not a phone room, um, you know, it's another space where you can relax. Um, and the survey findings really support that too. I don't want to go too much into it, but it's all published online and you can just go ahead and Google Capital One 2018 Work Environment Survey. And there are other slides, we just, I don't know if we want to press through other slides. Um, but Maybe if we stall a lot. Yeah, it came through, we did a, a similar round of surveys and wellness and employee comfort and, um, came through quite significantly. Um, and I think I'm, I'm proud to say that 90, I'll say 99% of all of our spaces that we've built have access to natural light and that was a huge win. Um, the, and going forward, we will do that. All of our buildings are being certified and well certified. Um, things like having access to water, right? it's a big deal. They, and that we've gotten resounding positive feedback on little things like that that make a big difference. Um, also, adding access to fitness centers has been, or, or fitness center membership. In fact, we didn't build it big enough. <coughs> More people are going than we thought. And um, in our Dallas campus, which was our first rollout, the biggest protest from the employees was at a town hall when we announced the healthy food program and somebody you know it raised their hand and it was almost a riot and the riot was about the Diet Coke and you know we just kind of had to sit there and say well you can have Diet Coke but the cans are this big and you're not going to get your big bulk cup we can't do that it's so anyways we've moved in and there are no more complaints about Diet Coke. I don't know if they're bringing it themselves, but <laughs> it was fine. Once you move in, it's fine. But it, it, in all honesty, in all of these programs that we rolled out, surprisingly, it hasn't been so much about the workspace, but the healthy food program has been people's biggest fear, food. I, I just say food and fitness. Food and fitness, always top when we're asking employees about what is most important to them from an amenities and experience perspective. The other thing I was going to say around wellness is an activity-based plan is actually really healthy because people are moving throughout the space and sitting is a new smoking, but apparently standing too much is also bad too, right? So it's about that flexibility, movement throughout the space, and about productivity at the end of the day too, so that people are supported in what they're doing and they're not distracted or interrupted. They have places for focus and quiet. Also, when we're asking employees about what's important to them in the workspace or what's not working so well, most of the time, coming from a more traditional environment, is that they don't have a place to focus. People out in the open, if they don't have those places to go, 
take a call, get away, not be interrupted. I mean, it's detrimental to their satisfaction and their productivity. And, and you see a lot of that research, it seems like every week I read an article about the death of the open plan and it was a failure and we're going to go back to offices. And every time I read one of those, the conclusion is the same. When you don't have those activity yeah. bases and that choice, yeah. it will fail. If all you give them is an open environment, it will fail. But if you give them the focus from the wellness space, the you know meditation or whatever you want to call it, you give them that flexibility, then it's successful. And, and that brings about that, that wellness because people want to know that they have those choices. Uh, you want people to come to the office and want to be there. Um, and if they have the right places where they can work properly, they will enjoy the workplace. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention about wellness goes back to what you were saying about finding the, the champions and those who are raising their hands. When we did our first fitness center, we did a traditional fitness center with weightlifting and, and aerobic machines. And it was great because we had never had them before. But then, of course, a month later, somebody asked, why can't we have the yoga lessons there? There's no yoga room and stretching rooms. Um, so, you know, we, we didn't have the ability to build that anymore, but, and this has nothing to do with real estate, it's more the leadership of the, of the company. They said, fine, and there was a, a yoga instructor that, that asked about this. Yeah. And you know what, that's fine, we have a lot of open spaces, we can move the furniture, if you want to bring and have yoga here, in the middle of the office floor in this corner, just organize it. So every, I think it was Tuesdays and Thursdays for six months, there were yoga and stretching lessons in, in that area for 50 minutes because we had that one volunteer. So give those opportunities and try it out. Um, you know, it didn't catch on enough to warrant having and building up a room, but they still do it from time to time and, and having, giving them that option really helped them and, and they felt like they could do that if that's what they wanted. I'm really glad they don't have to worry about food or exercise. It is not in my purview. Um, Mostly within my role and within my team, one of the things we focus on a lot is ergonomics. Um, we have a, a deep past in workers' comp, so we've always focused on ergonomics in the office. Um, our employees are very um, aware of it and they expect it. So as we go to these more flexible environments, it's it's a million things you don't think about when you know some person's desk has to go down to a certain you know height, but your standard pet doesn't allow that, and that's fine when it's dedicated because you can swap that pet open now. And you have to do that. Thousands and thousands and thousands of times. So it's, it's thinking of all those different things about how putting somebody now into a desk that they don't have every day is still just as ergonomic as the one before. So we've adopted different chairs that are, can accommodate more people. Because um, we were going to have like thousands of people like tagging the chair and dragging around the office all day, which wasn't going to work. Um, so it, it, that's been really like the, our at least my main focus on the wellness part. Um, just say Poppin has pedestal specifically for sit stand desks if anyone's interested. Um, <laughs> sorry, I cannot myself. Um, you mentioned kind of the empowerment of the employees once they have these new spaces uh, that are designed for them. How have you seen, have you seen employee behavior change as you've been redoing these spaces? Oh, I've got a good one. <laughs> Wait, um, in both Dallas and Richmond, our employees, they were having problems with the dress code. And so, and there was like a huge HR effort to enforce this dress code because people were coming to work just dressed so shabby. We moved into the new facility and I was there last week and they're literally like overdressed. I mean, this would be underdressed for the new facility and people just feel a lot better about themselves and they're dressing up for work and I think that's a pretty good indicator. Um, the other thing that we've seen is their, our badge access went up. So, even though they're a nine to five and they clock in and clock out, um, our badge access at that site, I and mean, typically you run badge access and it's always between 52 and 63%. The new building, we're seeing it at like 75 to 80%. So people are really coming in and they, it shows that they enjoy being there. I would say our workplace solutions group is really serious about our communications and change management planning. Um, and it, it really helps to see success and adoption of these different spaces when we actually tour associates through their new space. I have a little bit of FOMO right now because I totally missed out on our kind of grand opening big tour of our um, new headquarters building in Tyson's Corner. 
It's 31 stories tall, so it's, it's the tallest occupied building in the D.C. area. But today, the teams were taking people through, showing people, and helping them understand the spaces that are available for them to use so that they actually do use it. And the building's been open for a little while, and it's been really exciting to walk through and actually see people using the spaces in really cool, dynamic ways. Seeing people collaborate outside on an outdoor terrace space, I like wanted to take a bunch of photos and then I helped myself back um, just so they could continue doing their thing. Um, but it's really important that you share the story behind the design so that you get people excited about it and really share in the passion for the design. I think that's really great, Amanda. The extra touch of the in-person communications. I see a lot of times a default to just emails and, oh, we sent it out, so they must know what we're talking about. <laughs> um, but uh, I think the rule is uh, seven times is uh, the amount it takes to buy something to convince somebody of something. So. Communicating the same thing in so many different vehicles, you, you might feel like you're being repetitive, but uh, people are absorbing information in very different ways. People are very distracted, they're not paying attention when you tell them the first time. So um, a tour and really uh, taking them through the journey of how to use this space is super important. Um, I just did that with um, a client the other week, and. People were finally paying attention as you're showing them the different spaces and explaining the intent of the use. It is not going to happen just on its own because you've built this great space. If you build it, they may not come. <laughs> they're going to retreat to the behaviors that they've had in, in the past unless they're educated on how they're supposed to be used and how it actually can improve their, their productivity. I think you do have to be aware, though, that not everybody wants this. And yes. we give you a sit-to-stand desk, not everyone wants to stand. That's okay. I think we have, like, as we went through this, like, why isn't anyone using it? And eventually people do start using it when it fits the way they work, but everybody doesn't work that way, and not everybody wants to sit at a counter, you know, looking out the window. It's, so I think we have to be, like, very comfortable with, we can build it, hopefully a lot of them will come, but they might not. Yeah. Well, that's also, like, so you move in and sometimes you just get a ton, of, like a lot of times you get a ton of really bad feedback. And your teams are like, oh, we just did all this work and we just moved all these people in. But then, to your point, you let them sit in it for like three months, four months. We don't survey until six months in at a minimum, if not a year. And, you know, think, they figure things out and they need time to figure things out and get comfortable. So I do not suggest doing your post occupancy survey any less than or any yeah, any less than six months out because you'll get very different results. All right, it's about that time, so I wanted to just turn it over to see if there were any questions in the audience. Or, uh, yeah. How do you guys navigate your Trends and changes and how things they want things to happen. Well, I mean, we are lucky in the way that a lot of this is coming from the leadership. We have the, the reason we're doing all of this is not to follow a trend, but there's strategic business reasons behind this, and it's not just about maximizing the square footage or minimizing the occupancy expense. Yeah, those are KPIs that are important, but that this aligns with our business goals. Uh, like she was saying, we're transforming into a technology um, company. Uh, it, our products are more about software these days than anything else, so we have to think about that type of working, and the leadership recognizes them, so we're just supporting the business strategy. Um, so if you're trying to do something just because it's the trend and you want to push it up, it's going to be much harder, but when you're doing something and you can show how it aligns with the business strategy of the company, then you just have to show the data and and it's, it's quite easy. You, you just I guess the answer is you have to align it with, with the business strategy to make it work. I would say having a really good governance process. So uh, when we took this on, I had our chief HR officer and our CFO aligned. They were the ones directing this. And I said, here are all the things that are going to happen and you're going to have to have my back. I'm going to come to you and I'm going to have arrows all over the place. And I need you to help me pull them out. 
And um, they were really good at doing that. And I think that was critical. Um, the other thing is, is communicating and managing up the information for why you're doing something or why they shouldn't do something in a way that's meaningful to them. Um, fortunately, uh, you know, there's kind of a cost that we're spending in anything above and beyond. They, we go back to them and say, you can do this, but here's the incremental cost. And quite frankly, cost often in our company at least rules out what they want to do and they step back and say, oh, if that's going to hit my p and I think I'm okay with what you guys are doing. So, but I think at the end of the day, it always comes back to that leadership support and at every level and arming them also. It, it's taken a lot of effort to, you know, constantly send up talking points to them based on what's going on so that they have them. Um, or, you know, when the CFO does a town hall, his quarterly town hall, make sure you get something on the agenda, even if it's five minutes about the new workplace. Um, get corporate comms on your side and have them set up a website and a drumbeat of, of of um, changes that are happening. We, we run websites for every project or one run, uh, I don't know what you call it, but there's a little piece on our corporate website at all times of some stats and some employee testimonials. But really, that, it's super important, the communications and the top-down support. Someone else had a question back there? to a flex environment has been different and we didn't know going in what exactly was going to work so I think we did, it, did our best to you know, have some good data to say this is what we'll do, this is how many focus rooms we'll give you, this is how many, you know, whatever types of work and then you, you got to watch and see what's actually working before you do the next one and in, in my department at least the projects never stop coming uh, so by the time you get those learnings you might have missed four, five, six projects uh, but you just got to adapt. about having the data is really important, understanding the different needs of the different groups, um, but having that modularity, like you said, right. mentioned too, to make those swaps really easy if no, the I'm needs really change, but um, both quantitative and qualitative information to inform that design is, I think, really crucial. Yeah, one of our projects, I had to make a call, and we hadn't done all our research yet and hadn't really gone in and done our departmental interviews yet, but we were on a very short delivery. And with this modular design, right, the 10 by 12 rooms, for example, the architect says, we got to order furniture, you know, what am I doing? And I said, oh, just make 50% of them huddle rooms and buy furniture for huddle rooms for 50%, um, and buy 50% office furniture. And I knew we had a couple more floors to do, so if I messed up, we could have used them elsewhere. But the key was, that, and we ended up adjusting later on in the project, but we actually got to open with our furniture rather than having to rent furniture or wait for it. Um, but the real key there was that design, and we only have, I think, I think it's six room types now that we build. And so if we get it wrong, we can very quickly fix it, and it's not a work order. You know, we're not going in and, and redropping cable or running electrical. It's literally a furniture swap. So, um, you know, it's flexible as you can build that environment and as modular you can react to the changing needs and quite frankly more often than not the group that you're building it for when you start the project by the time you get in it's an entirely different group and an entirely different leadership and an entirely different manager so and not only there's there's experts right in JLL uh, all these real estate service providers they have all that data so if it's the first project you're doing they can give you a baseline they can tell you start with this ratio also, the, the workplace design firm, the Gensworth and IAs of the world, they have all, all of that data also. It might not be exactly the way your users will utilize it, but then that's when you start looking at the data and changing. But your baseline, you know, we rely on experts like JLL all the time. They have that on the field. 